And thank you for joining us for CBN News. Watch MF from Graham. Here are some of the big headlines we're following for you right now in the CBN newsroom. Vice President Mike Pence stopped in Alaska to tour missile, de missile defense facilities on Monday. This is the first stop of a six-day trip designed to increase pressure on North Korea. Pence told reporters, quote, we'll be telling the truth about North Korea at every stop. The vice president is on his way to Japan and then South Korea for the Winter Olympics. This year's flu is the worst on record in the last decade. 15,000 people have been hospitalized, hospitalized this year and 53 children have died from flu-related illnesses. Health experts say we still haven't hit the peak of flu season. A Palestinian stabbed an, an Israeli man to death near the West Bank Monday. The attack happened at a bus stop near, Air, near, near Ariel. An army officer chased the man by car, but he managed to get away. A police spokesperson said the Israeli man died from stabbing wounds. You can learn more about these stories and more by visiting CBNNews.com. The battle of classified memos continues. The House Intelligence Committee has voted to release a second classified memo about whether the FBI and Justice Department conspired against President Donald Trump. Democrats wrote the memo in an effort to counter some of the arguments and evidence in the Republicans' document that was declassified by Trump last week. President Trump has five days to decide whether to allow the Democrats' memo to be published. Stock, the stock market around the world is, is taking a beating today after Monday's dramatic sell-off on Wall Street. But many market experts are not overly concerned. Adil Heard is following this story. The Dow's smooth ride above 25,000 has run into a brick wall, but it was a pullback analysts had warned was long overdue. Some are tempted to think the sky might be falling. Most experts do not. Fears of higher interest rates escalated into a rapid selling frenzy Monday, some of it computer generated, that wiped out the market's gains for the year. At one point, the Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped 1,000 points in less than an hour, and it ended with its worst day in more than six years. The stock market has gone too far too fast. It is just appropriate to hit the reset button. Before Monday, the S&P 500 index had gone a historic period of time, about 400 trading days without a drop of even 5%. Market professionals warned that the sell-off could continue for a bit, but few see a recession on the horizon, and they expect the strengthening global economy and healthy corporate earnings to eventually help stock prices recover. The White House said long-term economic fundamentals remain exceptionally strong. Today's sell-off uh, represents the ebb and flow of our stock markets. When the market pulls back, and particularly as, as sharply as we've seen in recent days, there's this natural tendency to think, oh no, what's wrong? There's nothing wrong. Uh, what you're seeing is just some profit taking because of the fact that interest rates are going up. President Trump was in Ohio Monday praising his recently passed tax overhaul law saying his tax cuts are at the center of the improving economy. We've already created nearly 2.6 million jobs since the election, including more than 200,000 new jobs in manufacturing. Some in the news media were busy poking at the president over Monday's corrections, saying Donald Trump took credit for rising stocks, and so people could say he has to take responsibility for a falling market. But many experts think this sell-off is just a speed bump on the way to even higher prices down the road. Dale Hurd, CBN News. A former anchor for CBN News' Spanish news program, Mundo Cristiano, has won the first round of the presidential election in Costa Rica. Journalist-turned-politician Fabricio Alvarado will face a second round in April. He campaigned on a pro-family, pro-life traditional marriage platform in the Catholic country. Gary Lane has more on this story. The presidential election was unprecedented for Costa Rica because Alvarado, an evangelical Christian, was declared the winner. However, he did not receive a majority of votes and must face a runoff against the pro-government candidate, Carlos Alvarado. It's the first time in the country's history that an evangelical Christian has gotten close to holding the office of president of the republic. Fabricio Alvarado is a former journalist who co-anchored the Spanish version of CBN's Christian World News, Mundo Cristiano, from March 2009 to September 2013. He also is a Christian singer who in the last four years has served as a deputy in the Costa Rican Congress. 
Fabricio Alvarado had an impressive rise in polls during the last month of the presidential campaign. That was attributed to his firm stance against same-sex marriage. And Costa Rican churches also played a significant role in the election result, motivating prayer and advocating defense of the traditional family. Focus on the family director, Sisto Poras, explained. The Costa Rican family is at a crossroads because this government betrayed the values of those who elected them. They want to impose a sexual education guide which stimulates homosexuality, which sexually activates our children from childhood. They want to change the institution of the family and of marriage. They want to legalize abortion, as other countries have done. Costa Rica, like Latin America, has said no. A second round in the Costa Rican presidential election will be held Easter Sunday, April 1st. Gary Lane, CBN News. Still ahead, dangerous border patrols see what needs to be done to keep Americans safe along the wall. Border Patrol agents face danger on a daily basis to keep America safe. Those who are illegally trying to cross the border aren't just people looking for a better life. They're often drug dealers, smugglers, and gang members seeking easy money, and they'll do anything to get it. CBN's national security correspondent Eric Gonzalez takes us along for a ride with Border Patrol. Right here is the Rio Grande River. Behind it, Mexico, just a stone's throw away. I'm standing in the U.S. Border Patrol's Rio Grande Valley sector, the busiest smuggling route for both narcotics and illegal aliens. Marijuana remains the drug of choice flowing from Mexico, but agents report an uptick in harder narcotics like cocaine and methamphetamine. Despite the historic drop okay. in arrests of undocumented immigrants, assaults on Border Patrol agents have nearly doubled. Because of the uh, lack of infrastructure in this area, um, this area is known as or sees more of the symptoms of a chaotic border. Um, we have more uh, FTYs, failures to yield. We have more stash houses. Uh, we have more alien traffic and, of course, in this particular area, more narcotic uh, flow going into the United States. This past year, 774 assaults took place, mainly in the Rio Grande Valley area. Paloa Vega knows that danger firsthand. Cherish every moment that you have with your family. Um, be safe. Um, always, always watch your back. Two illegals shot and killed her husband, Javier, as he patrolled the border. She tells me she remains strong for her three boys and says without her faith in Jesus, she never would have survived. I believe that my family right now is as normal as possible, given our situation. And um, without God, that it wouldn't have happened. There's no way that we'd be such a strong family without him. That kind of faith keeps many agents here going as they go about their daily and often dangerous routine. And you'll start seeing all the, the trash that they leave behind, the water bottles, um, some of their personal belongings. Agents say the biggest misconception is that most illegal immigrants crossing the border here are from Mexico. ¿Cuántos veces? This man from Honduras says he tried three times to cross the border illegally. The other top countries are El Salvador and Guatemala. So his story, he's been apprehended 12 times. 12 times. And each time the man's been sent back to Guatemala. Agents call him the group's coyote or trail guide. We never know who we're encountering in the brush. You could encounter a, a sex offender, a, a murderer. You know, somebody who has an active warrant, you just never know until you take them back to the station, you roll their fingerprints and you get that information back, right? In reality, last year, fiscal year 17, we had uh, a rest of over 70 different nations. And this year to date, we're well over uh, 30 uh, nations of different nationalities that we've apprehended. Chief Manuel Padilla Jr., who heads up the Rio Grande Valley sector, says his agents have even arrested known terrorists. Agents say smugglers don't care who or what they bring in as long as they get paid. I'm in an abandoned house just about a half a mile from the border, and this is one of the houses where uh, U.S. Border Patrol has uncovered as a drug stash house. You can see uh, some of the religious figures up here where someone was actually staying inside. This is a, a bathroom just behind the garage where there's a hidden compartment. The rooms are filled with clothes and other items. Agents say the smugglers sit on the drugs until it's safe to transport them throughout the U.S. Chief Padilla says while the Trump administration has made a difference regarding border security, 
Many illegals still exploit loopholes in the system. He says criminal organizations often send gang members as unaccompanied children or with fake families. Counterfeit documents, uh, modified documents that are being issued uh, in certain countries to make a family, if you will, you know, just uh, establish a parenthood of, a, of a, uh, a child. And then once we start interviewing, we find out uh, it's all false claims. These children are turned over to Health and Human Services. Border Security says sometimes they're released to family members already here in the U.S. The twist is they're given a court date, which some never attend. The issue has caught the attention of the president, which he highlighted in the State of the Union by introducing families who've been victims of MS-13 criminal activity. Tonight I am calling on Congress to finally close the deadly loopholes that have allowed MS-13 and other criminal gangs to break into our country. We have proposed new legislation that will fix our immigration laws and support our ICE and Border Patrol agents so that this can never happen again. Despite the danger, Paloa Vega sons hope to follow in their father's footsteps and become Border Patrol agents. As she continues to pray for her family, Paloa is also seeking justice for her husband's killers. They are still in court. I still haven't been able to sleep comfortably, and I don't think I will until justice is served. Agents are covering greater distances, encountering larger number of immigrants, and exposing themselves to greater danger. But they say they will continue to rely on their training and each other. Eric Rosales, CBN News, somewhere along the U.S.-Mexico border. At a time when slaves weren't allowed to gather, a black pioneer preached to 500. See how his legacy is being carried on to this day. Continuing our celebration of Black History Month, we take a look back at why celebrities from around the United States came together to celebrate the restoration of a church bell. Take a look. On this sunny February day, hope and healing bring people from all across the country to a tiny church in Williamsburg, Virginia. To understand why, we need to go back 240 years to the founding of the church and the nation. The man who started First Baptist Church is found at a tavern of all places. Their popular meeting spots in Williamsburg, Virginia State Capitol in 1776. The man is named Gowan and works at the King's Arms Tavern. And although a slave, he's one of America's first ordained black ministers. He hears the patriots talking, Patrick Henry, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, and many others. They're passing things like the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which includes uh, a free exercise of religion clause. In 1776, it was illegal for more than five slaves to gather together without permission from their slave masters. So First Baptist Church began in secrecy, somewhere in these woods. The white society saw religious meetings of slaves as as, as threatening, as in, inspirational toward rebelling or uh, uh, attempting to loosen the, the, uh, the bonds of slavery. Gowan's name first appears in the historical record in 1779, but not in a positive sense. The Virginia Gazette prints an ad accusing him of stealing a horse, a hanging offense. Fortunately, he is never charged, and over the next few years, his congregation grows to more than 200 members. 1793 proves to be a watershed year for Gowan, despite accusations of involvement in a multi-state slave rebellion plot. He gains membership for his church in the mostly white Dover Baptist Association and is freed from slavery as shown in this deed. It is the first time we see the surname he chose for himself, Pamphlet. Why do you think he chose Pamphlet? <laughs> That's been a subject of intense interest, as you might ima imagine. We don't find anyone else, white or black, named Pamphlet. I happened to run across a compilation of pamphlets from the 18th century that had to do with every subject imaginable. And it occurred to me, did he 
adopt that name because he knew of the effectiveness of pamphlets circulating on various topics. Sweet Jesus. Pamphlets Now 500 member congregation meets in a wooded area called Raccoon Chase on the outskirts of Williamsburg. Then around 1805, a white neighbor hears their worship and offers them the use of his carriage house in downtown Williamsburg. Gowan Pamphlet dies within two years. His legacy is determination to keep this church alive, to bring it the respect it deserved, and to persevere in the face of all kinds of adversity. He was determined that his church wasn't going to exist it, in the shadows. It was right. going to. It was going to be in the open. Some 50 years later, First Baptist dedicates their first church building on the same property. Within a short time, they acquired their bell. 100 years later, in 1956, they moved to their present building, but the bell is not installed properly and soon becomes inoperable. Let freedom reign. Although the bell remains silent throughout the civil rights era, the church does not. They host activists like Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks. This year, to celebrate the church's 240th anniversary, the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation takes on the task of restoring the 500-pound bell. In light of heightened racial conflict in places like Ferguson, Missouri and Baltimore, Maryland, a nationwide campaign begins called Let Freedom Ring Challenge, inviting Americans of all races to register to ring the bell for freedom throughout the month of February. I will ring the bell for hope. For justice for immigrants. For little boys and little girls whose brown skin is made to make them feel less than. That brings us to today's celebration. We every day. And so we come to ring the bell to drive out the spirits of division and those practices that are causing us to forget that we are one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The first to ring the bell are a family who knows a lot about racial reconciliation, descendants of Thomas Jefferson by two women, his wife, Martha, and her half-sister, slave Sally Hemings. It was just a powerful moment, you know, you can feel the spirit move inside with so much hope and energy in the building, you know. When you cross that line, that's where the good stuff happens. You really find out what other people feel and think. You walk in their shoes and you see that it's better together than apart. People black and white came together and found common ground, and that's the great challenge. How do we move from, from racial battleground? Then can I come around tomorrow on higher ground? We meet with the pastor two days later amid a steady stream of bell ringers. How did things go here from a broken bell, as we hear it now, in a small church? Yes. To this nationwide cause that we're seeing? Yes. Well, the idea just began to surface that we can repair this bell looking at the backdrop of our nation. Let's encourage a new start. You had the birth of the nation, you had the slaves, let's merge that together because we want one America. And so the idea came to repair the bell, commit ourselves to the principles and the values that made this nation great. With that thought in mind, Pastor Davis rang the bell Monday with his family. I made a connection with the past and I also made a commitment to myself that I'm gonna do all I can to make sure that those who suffered, bled, and died, that the work that they have done to get us to where we are now would not be in vain. Indeed, would not be in vain. I had the chance to ring the bell myself. I did that in honor of my grandmother, Beatrice Graham. 99, be 100 soon. Stay with us, we'll be right back.
It is time now for your Tuesday Tweetable, and here's the message I hope will inspire you and encourage you to take the time to post, tag, tweet, and share with others. Know this, God is ready to turn your battlefield into your blessing field. So don't sweat the place where you are. God can move right there, and he's standing by, ready, willing, and able to do it. Well, that is going to do it for this edition of CBN Newswatch. Remember, you can always find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about always at CBNNews.com. And take the time to tell us what you think about the stories we've, you've seen here today. We would certainly love to hear from you. You can do that by emailing newswatch at CBN.com. And of course, you can always reach out and touch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hope you'll join us again right here next time for the next edition of CBN Newswatch. Until then, goodbye, God bless, and make this a very terrific Tuesday. We'll see you right back here come tomorrow. Goodbye, everybody, and God bless you.